But we've all been using words in our groups, and the findings of the group are going, groups are going to be projected onto the screen in a few minutes, as soon as they're ready to do it. Uh, but in the meantime, I thought we might want to begin with a little bit of discussion about the process. How did you feel the group discussions went? Now, I don't want your personal feelings about it, uh, because your personal feelings will be your personal feelings, but how you felt the group worked as a whole. And I would prefer it if the group leader was not the person to speak, that one of the group participants was the person to speak. So any group participant, please, reflecting on how he or she felt the process went. I will be very happy to take three or four. So maybe somebody can take the lead. No feelings? No feelings. OK, we have a volunteer here. Can I have a microphone in front? And if two or three others can get ready to speak, that'll be lovely. Ah, very good. We have somebody at the back. And do start, please. Uh, start, please. Fariba Hashemi from EPFL. I was in the group uh, led. Could, it, could I request you to stand up? Because it just helps the photographer, the, the film people, to be able to photograph you properly. Do, do please stand up. Yes. Fariba Hashemi from EPFL. I was in a group with uh, five, six others, led by Christopher Wasserman. The group was, um, we came from diverse cultures, diverse languages, diverse uh, uh, professions. We all came in with different ideas. We finished with a series of four main points that we wanted to share with the rest of you. And I let maybe Christoph do that. Good. Well, well, we'll have that, of course, up on the screen. Thank you. And there was a lady at the back. How did you feel the process worked? How do you feel the people in the group felt about the whole process? Uh, I think the process worked. Sorry, give us your yes, name. Yes, my name is Barbara Geary Truon. Barbara. I was in group mm. R. And I think the process worked very well because of our group leader. But I do think it was a challenging thing to do, uh, people coming answering a very broad question, very difficult, complex, and deep question. And we all came from, we, don't, we didn't all know each other. We all came from different perspectives. So in my opinion, the process worked very well, but we were short for time. And we were, um, uh, it, it, was, it was a challenge. So next time, we'll have two days for the process. <laughs> Maybe not two days. <laughs> very good. Anybody else would like to speak on how they felt the group worked? how they felt the group perceived the process? Not at the moment. OK. I have a couple of announcements which I'd like to share with you before we have the, I hope by that time, the uh, feedback from the groups will be ready. Uh, my first is that you will have on your seats, I hope, survey sheets, which we would like you to fill up and return tomorrow, or if some of you are leaving very early in the morning or tonight. Uh, but before you go, please complete the survey sheets and hand them in to reception, or, or hand them in at the secretariat desk. There will be a kind of basket, and you can put the survey sheets there. Secondly, I believe that there are five of the presentations, projects, initiatives, which have to be presented this evening, which have already given their posters and other material to reception desk, but five have not. So if the five that have not yet handed in their posters and materials can do so to reception desk, then the material can be up and ready at the time that we have the projects and initiatives and so on being shown. OK? And I believe we are ready now for our slides, are we? Great. Excellent. Can we have them, please? And uh, the format we are going to follow is there are five chapters or five sheets of paper that are going to come up, five screens that are going to come up. And for each of them, Pierre Tapie has kindly offered to give a commentary lasting about two minutes. So we will have, uh, for each of the five sheets, two minutes commentary, but not one after the other. So after each of the sheets and commentary, there will be time for us to interact with what's been said. So can I ask the first sheet, please, to be put up? And can I ask Pierre to come up? Pierre? Would you like to? Yeah, that's probably the easiest. Maybe I'll sit down as well. Then we have a good chance to 
have ourselves heard. Can you see that clearly enough? Maybe on this side? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. You have the first sheet already, so but go ahead. It was, it was supposed to be presented by the authors, not to have just that. And I comment on that. No, no you, you comment on it straight away. Oh, I'm yes. supposed to comment on that now? Yes. Okay. That, no. <laughs> that, uh, I, you, you, you're sure that they are not the, the rule of Well, the if we have 13 people presenting 13 okay. groups, then obviously all okay, the time Okay, fine, gone. fine. Uh, so I, I think what is interesting on the educational dimension is that what has been put on this sheet of paper, I will not reread that, of course, it, it will be uh, a loss of, of time, are things which today, except probably the revolutionary ideas about uh, stem cell and this disruptive change, are things which are today a real matter of debate within the business school. So it's a debate which is uh, stronger or, or not so strong depending on one place to another, but really if you take, for example, holistic model of education, uh, learn experiential learning and so on and so forth, this is a type of thing which begins to be more and more promoted. Uh, the issue of paradigm change, uh, again, this refers to chronos or kairos perception of the time. Most of the business school today are thinking we are in a chronos time, not in a kairos time. So they are not so sure that they have really to readdress the paradigm change. And I think they will only do so if there is a significant pressure from the business world. So uh, your own leverage toward the business school asking for that will be key. Uh, I think there is a, a, a next uh, slide on education. Is there another one on education? We can check. Yeah, I think so. Yes. Um, business ethic issues, uh, business ethic to be, to be taught as up in, in school. Uh, I think any business schools today deals with the, with the ethical issue. In, uh, even in some accreditation process, like uh, ICSB accreditation, which is today the most powerful one around the world, uh, chapter 21, if my memory is correct, deals specifically with the question how ethical issue is integrated within the school into the different, either as a separate course or as, as an integral part of each course. And in fact, in the, 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 the challenge today is to know whether to form so-called ethical managers, uh, what will be the balance between uh, be giving ethic a full space of education as a, a, a discipline per se, where you can go deeper and so on and so forth, versus integrating in all the classes of marketing, finance, accounting, and so on, the ethical challenging or dilemma that you have in the business school. But the way each business school deals with that is something which is very close to the culture of the, of the school. After that, the, the, the other thing I think uh, sorry, are more uh, matter yeah, of debate. Before you go on, can I just yeah. check with Nicola? Uh, Nicola, sorry, by the way, Nicola, could you stand up? Can we all please give Nicola a hand because he has done most of the work in terms of organizing all the feedback from the groups. Thank you very much, Nicola. The feedback you did organize. Uh, could you just tell us, when the point about business ethics to be taught as soon as possible in school, was the idea to teach in business schools or in primary schools or in middle schools? What kind of thinking was it? First of all, uh, the credit for the organization uh, must be given to a team that is called Ecophilos, so we are uh, seven of us. So maybe all the seven from Ecophilos could stand up, please. Could all seven stand up? Yes, lovely. Yes. Thank so, you very much for supporting Nicola with the organization. So what we saw is that the, um, we have um, groups that uh, come from a very soft uh, proposal, um, like uh, uh, schools uh, should include ethics, to very extreme proposal that uh, business schools should be burnt. 
and uh, Which several the board, Nicola. <laughs> and um, um, several groups uh, have mentioned that um, it's not enough to start in uh, university and business schools, but we start we should start very early with uh, kids in the family and uh, very very soon. Thank you. D so that's quite interesting. Just, as well. just a comment of have we to burn the business school? That's a very good hypothesis. Uh, Sumantra Goshal, who was an outstanding professor of strategy in the, for long years, uh, three months before dying in 2005, he was professor at London Business School at this moment. Uh, so he, he was knowing he was to, to die. He had a cancer, an advanced cancer. And so he was a very free person. And, uh, and he said it was in 2005, so, so three years before the crisis. You know, uh, probably, probably business school should not ask themselves what they should teach in addition to what they are doing today and so on and so forth. They, will, they should probably ask themselves what they should stop to teach. That's interesting, but, but uh, the interesting hypothesis of burning all the business school uh, uh, returns to the market uh, that Xavier Fontanet was uh, speaking a little earlier. If you do so, uh, the demand is such that you will have a lot of new business school which maybe will be worse than the present ones. So, um, do, do, are you an evolutionary person trying to convert the present business school into something better? Or do you burn every, all that creating something new? Well. So the been. people proposing to burn were proposing also to, to, to replace by something else, not just burn. Very good. Uh, we can carry on the debate, but can I open it up to the rest of our audience, as it were? Uh, any responses or comments? I have Christopher here. Can I have a microphone for Christopher in front, please? And I see a hand. I see two hands, or one hand right at the back. Maybe since the microphone is there, you could start off. Thank you. Um, Give us your name because I can't see you from okay, here. Okay, I'm, I'm Jose Maria Simone from Argentina. Perhaps uh, I will throw something that may change a little bit the way we are thinking of. I should question what ethic is the purpose or is the mean. Perhaps the change in the focus is to say that ethics is a tool in order to stress up what is more important, ethics is to build up the dignity of man. And if we don't introduce that in schools, that everything that has to be done in the business mass, business, business manager, to help to build up again the uh, man dignity, I think we will continue being discussing about ethics in the schools as it has been in the last 20, 25 years. So, Good. 20, 25 years or more mm. being uh, taught about ethics and, th and things have not changed. What is there that has to be done to be changed? I think the focus is the is a purpose. Let's think about the person and the person per se in a whole concept, not only just a piece of it. Thank you. Uh, can I just take Christopher as well before we come back here? Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I went uh, as a free student to Philanthropos, which is a school, uh, some students here from Philanthropos, and they reintroduce, they really have one year sabbatical on social sciences, which has been removed from a lot of our schools. Now it's being reintroduced, so that's, I think, an important part, because actually we are dealing with virtues, we're dealing with uh, how to construct yourself as a person, and not only about learning scientific uh, disciplines. What I propose, and maybe Pierre, you can mention something about the EF, or GRLI, is working with a, a group of schools on the uh, global compact, uh, global responsibility principles, or a global... <laughs> Global Nobody Principles for Education, sorry. Maybe you can mention that because some schools like EPFL, IMD, etc., are not involved, uh, or even HSC, I, I believe, oh, you are, I'm sorry, then HSC is, but many schools are not, and there's maybe some synergies that can Good. be met by yeah. um, this way. Yeah. Pierre? 
Uh, I will answer the second question because it's, a, it's, an, inter it's an important question about trend among the area of business school. Uh, it, to answer the first one, which is the purpose of the mean uh, as a professor of ethics, I think Henri-Claude de Bettigny, who has fought within INSEAN since about uh, 23 or 25 years 25. to introduce business ethics in the, late, in the late 80s, is probably the best person to try to answer that question. Henri-Claude, do you want to speak to that? There's a microphone for Henri-Claude de Bettigny, please. Professor Henri-Claude de Bettigny. I still think that to teach business ethics in a business school is very difficult. And I think professors of business ethics may have to be very creative and innovative to uh, become more effective in uh, in teaching ethics. Uh, I was recently in, in China and I uh, had a meeting with 82 professors of business ethics in China, Chinese professors. And uh, to my surprise, uh, I found them uh, rather lost on the, what should we teach, what kind of ethics should we teach, how should we teach it, how to develop materials, and uh, teaching materials. And I think we have also the same problem uh, in Europe, I think there is a great amount of material, but I'm not sure that we have the best process in order to enhance the moral uh, awareness or the moral fiber of managers, particularly at the middle management level. I think at MBA, it's uh, easier, and with the CEO, is also easier for a number of reasons that all of you know in this room. But the middle management, I think when we talk about ethics, social responsibility and so forth, uh, have uh, more difficulties to take the message because they said, well, go to talk to my boss, you know, I have to do what they ask me to do. And ethics is very nice, you know, it's keep busy a small number of professors of business ethics, but uh, it does not really give us a solution to the pressure and the competitive environment in which we work today. So I think there is a challenge for the teaching of ethics, and I agree that we should start very early, but certainly in this uh, audience, uh, business school have a responsibility to rethink how to become more effective in trying to build the moral fiber of the future generation. Uh, Ori Claude, I'm really struck by your statement that our Chinese business school uh, professors did not know what to teach in terms of ethics. And this is, I think, highlighted by the, um, by the particular uh, by the second, or, or is it third bullet point there, uh, defining ethics as being a manner of honor. The question is, what is honor? In Pakistan, to be an honorable man means to kill your daughter if she does what is not acceptable in society, which can be as little as looking at a man she's not supposed to look at. So what actually do we mean by honor? What actually do we mean by integrity? This is the challenge. I think we duck the issue of what moral values we're trying to teach. Uh, and this was at your invitation, Henri Claude, you remember about 20 years ago, I came to INSEAD and I spoke at INSEAD. And my first, in my very first class, I asked the business school, all top people from around the world, uh, to just tell me what the Ten Commandments are. And in your class, I found the maximum number of people who could tell me what the Ten Commandments are, and that was two of them. And they were both Orthodox Jews, so of course they could recite it to you in, in Hebrew if you wanted. But none of the Christians could tell me what the Ten, Commandment were, Ten Commandments were, nor could any of the Hindus or Muslims who were there. So it's quite interesting. What do we mean by ethics? I think this is the big question which is up for grabs in our society. But perhaps Philippe de Vaud would like to respond to that. I would Professor like to Devote. be a, bit, uh, little, a little more brutal. I think we are deceiving ourselves. The existing business schools have been a complete failure. If we look at the results that Professor Searle showed us uh, this afternoon, this is a disaster. If we look at the way the system is leading us to the abyss, uh, it is a disaster. My point is that the business schools are training robots of short-term success. They're not training entrepreneurs, they're not training leaders, they're not training statesmen. And I was the one who proposed to burn the existing business school <laughs> and to replace them by completely new ones. And this is one of our projects, is the Blue Sky Business School, inventing something new, 
because what exists now is absolutely unchangeable, so we have to replace them. Or we can tell them, transform yourself immediately or disappear. This is my point. Very good. Thank you. Can I take you first, and then I'll go there. I can't even see who it is, but please go ahead. Two short comments. The first yes. one is, I think that Jean-François de la Vison. I think that um, uh, ethics is something which has not to be just studied uh, effectively in the business schools. I think that ethics is something which concerns life. And in your education, in the education that you give to the kids, to your kids, to the children, you, have to, you, you need to have uh, ethics. The second point is, uh, I am teaching ethics, business ethics, in a French business school, in HEC with a Benedictine monk. Mm -hmm. uh, in the business school, ethics is something which is exclusive. There is exclusivity when you teach ethics in a business school. And the main point for me, which is, and my question is, if we speak about universality of ethics, we should be able to bridge, I would say, all the business school together in order together to discuss about ethics. Thank you. Um, we should move on to the can other I, chapters, but I, I have one. Can I make a, a comment yeah. Do you like to do that now? Yeah, yeah because yes, it's just connected with the last one and Christopher one. Yeah. Um, as another option to burn all that mess, uh, I just have to share with you that between 2007 and 2011, many things have happened within the business school system as a system, I would say. In 2004, the Globally Responsible Leadership uh, Foundation has been created uh, by EFMD, which is a European Association of Business School, and by UNGC, Global Compact, in order to explore how to educate the next generation of globally responsible leaders. And the key item, the, the, the key DNA of that point was the following. Business schools are professional schools. If you are a school of medicine, you will educate future medical doctors also to the Hippocrates oath which means to the professional values at one given point in time. We are a professional organization. We are a professional higher education institution. So we have to educate also people to the real world. And so there is a egg and chicken issue of the, about the values which are at one moment within the business school compared to the value which are at one moment within the, the real business world. And so what the, the, key, the, the, the key idea of, of the GRI Foundation was that if we want to change short-termism, the world long-termism, we cannot do so without gluing together businesses and business schools. And the second step has been in 2007 when the principle for responsible management education have been promoted worldwide. Now 400 business schools around the world have signed this uh, prime principle, principle for responsible management education, whose the first principle is about the purpose. And the first principle is the purpose of the firms is to create economic and social value in a sustainable way. It's a very, very big change. And the next change, this is, was uh, in summer 2007, and the next change was in the last Worldwide International Conference of RCSB, 1,500 attendees in New York, where the elected chairman of the, the business school around the world from this professional association in front of uh, 1,500 persons said, um, if we think seriously about uh, our business as business educators, I think we have to reconsider the purpose of the firm. Three years before, I was in the board of RCSB introducing what were the prime principles and so on and so forth. I was one of the co-authors. And the, the, the issue uh, was eco with a polite silence. Because the average second tier uh, American business school dean which were there we are just thinking that uh, I was a, a, a very strange European guy who tried to promote uh, anything against uh, free capitalism and so on and so forth. Three years after, the minds had changed. So my information, just an information, is that among the business school, the consciousness of the deepness of, that, of the issue today is growing, but in order to, to make it grow faster, we need the help of the business world. Very good. Two qu comments, please, or three. 
a gentleman there, lady there, Rajita here, and then we'll move on to the second chapter of the feedback, please. Yeah, th thank you very much. I think besides the question, what are the contents of our values, which I think most of us in this room may po possibly agree on, is a question of methodology of teaching ethics or good leadership. I mean, if you have 24, 25 year old graduates from in a business school who never in their life have led a scouts group or took responsibility in a parish leading the mass servants or have taken up any other responsibility leadership role in a youth group or even at a university, then it will be very difficult to teach these young graduates how to lead responsible, uh, responsibly. So I think it's also a question of methodology and I like the word what, my, uh, what, what this gentleman said, that life is teaching you uh, uh, ethic. And I think this must be very practical and uh, experience-based. You can't, I'm afraid, teach ethic only theoretically and academically. Very good. Thank you very much. we we'll move on to the lady, please. Um, yes, my name is Suzanne Sinclair. I would like to comment on two things. One is about education of children. Someone said this morning that um, we were living our choices. Now, one of the choices in the Western world was to abolish religion as a branch at school because it was always linked to confession and there was no ambition to actually teach religion in terms of uh, history and, and other religions. So now we have to reintroduce it and we just give it a different name. I find that a bit bizarre, but maybe we have to think about that. The second um, issue is that I find it actually a bit appalling to discuss business ethics as a separate branch because we go exactly in the direction that we shouldn't go. In my opinion, business ethics should be an integrated part of all the business branches. It should be included in marketing, in purchasing, in law, in, uh, in anything. If you make it a separate branch again, you have a specialist, you have a process, you have a very male approach on going about it, which is killing it from the beginning. So uh, my appeal would be to integrate business yeah. ethics in everything. Thank you. Thank you. Rajita. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Prabhu. Um, you know, I wanted to share with everybody that we are launching, our organization is launching a new university in India. And one of the first programs we are launching is a school of management next academic year. And considering that there is so much discussion that we have done since yesterday about the need to integrate, uh, or like my friend Suzanne said, that it should be the underlying theme of the entire business education, I would like to welcome and propose that if we would be interested in creating a task force from some of the interested people here, where we have really an opportunity now to construct a zero plus curriculum of a new business school with a new paradigm. And this could be the beginning of really implementing in action some of the things that uh, we've had an opportunity to really discuss and share. So this is a thought I Thank want you. to share. Thanks. Thank you, that's very helpful. I'm sorry, we must go on because we have four more sets of feedback to go with. But since you're standing up with the microphone, yes. do go ahead. I, I'm Frederick Van Hems. Uh, three quick comments. I believe the problem is not only with business schools, because there's exactly the same issue with engineering schools, where most of the engineers, mm -hmm. After training in technical issues, what they dream to do is to be bankers or uh, uh, investment uh, bankers and not in engineering. And it's not only business schools. Yes. The no, second issue, as the, lady, okay. as the lady said, uh, I believe uh, ethics should not be a separated topic. Uh, or at least we should start by training the teachers of the other subjects about ethics. And the last comment is, I'm not sure that ethics is uh, the fundamental problem. I, I believe what has been said earlier today, that the, the real problem is the, the syndrome of divided lives. And, and as it was said uh, just before, the fact to, to bring our humanity to work. And I believe in the task force that you mentioned, that the key topic should be how to train the, the young children, how to train to unity, because we are to totally divided in our lives today. We are many different people, uh, depending on what we are doing at different times in the day or the week. Mm -hmm. And this lack of unity is the source of Thank many you. other problems. Thank you. Very good. Here you want to come back. Uh, uh, <laughs>
Just a, a 20 second comment. Uh, I think anybody uh, claims that uh, he or she teaches ethics is uh, co in a completely misleading way, but I do think that you can educate ethical consciousness at any age. And I think that if you see, for example, the program that HSBC has really introduced to retrain 8,000 managers of HSBC all around the world about ethical consciousness and how to uh, handle ethical dilemma, I can tell you, you the, the bright guys of 35 of A's, you do take them and you put them in very surprising situation, they, will have, they, they can be educated through their own consciousness to handle ethical dilemma. Very Thank good. You. We have uh, 15 minutes left and we have four sets of sheets still to go through. So what I propose is the following. I will flip through the sheets once and then maybe a second time so that we have time to think about them. And then I'll ask Pierre to comment on whichever one he chooses to comment on. And then we'll have a bit more discussion and we'll come back for a second key point which Pierre picks for discussion. Is that okay? So here we go. This is on leadership, and this picks up the point that has just been made by Mr. von Hames, unified life. Okay, may I go on? We are still writing, that's fine. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's fine. Okay, I'll go on then. The next one is also on leadership. Maybe you will pick a different point to comment on, and that's fine. So this is statesmanship. Lots of very rich material there to discuss, and as usual, too little time to discuss it in. But uh, shall I go on? Okay, this one is on statesmanship as well. Okay, shall I go on? Last one on statesmanship. Well, Pierre, maybe we want to pick one item out of all these for the next seven minutes, and then we go on to the next set of slides to pick one item for the next seven minutes. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Good. Which point would you like to pick up for discussion, Pierre? Uh, mainly, mainly three points. Uh, the first one is uh, which, which took place both in leadership and in statementship is uh, assessment yardstick. What are the tools for, for uh, performance measurement whether they will be uh, personal performance measurements uh, or whether they will be uh, company performance measurements. Uh, the mention statementship of re-including externalities in how you measure the performance of the company is something, of course, we, which is extremely powerful. And, of course, they are a part, there is a part of the system which is imposed to company because your performance is measured in way X, Y, Z. But there is also part of the performance which is really mission driven and which is in the hands of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the ancestors of that was the revolution that Roche uh, decided in years uh, 89 or 90, where Roche was uh, a chemical company, 
decide that now the purpose of the company was no more maximi maximizing the shareholder value to uh, the, the shareholder value, but at equal part, maximizing shareholder value and improving the environment and putting in all the executive performance measurement appraisal tools these two items at the same level. The good news is that the companies have really something to, to do uh, at the interface between the leadership and the statementship when they are designing all the performance uh, assessment uh, system. A second point uh, which also was, uh, uh, was mentioned in both is uh, get exposed. Uh, if you want really people who become leaders and not just manager, put them uh, in, in a situation where they discover very unusual situation. Today you have companies like PwC, KPMG, McKinsey and some big industrial companies, especially in the south, which are putting teams of their executive uh, for six weeks uh, in the summer uh, to do volunteering organized work in very poor areas of a third country in order to experience something which is meaningful and which is useful. And this transformed completely the sour of the corporation. And last point I, I pick from that is uh, B companies, which was an interesting concept we crossed yesterday. B companies, social entrepreneurship, not for profit and so on. It's likely that the very difference between for profit company and social entrepreneurship at large is something where you will find during the next years to come uh, a kind of passerelle. Uh, and uh, I think you will have companies, uh, if they really re readdress both their purpose and the mm -hmm. yardsticks, their measurements tool, which will be more balanced between the for-profit area and the not-for-profit area. And Wikipedia this morning was just an example for that. Good. Thank you. Comments from, the, from, our, from our participants? None at the moment, then I'll move on. So these are the next sheets coming up. Entrepreneurship. Shall I go on? And then Zermatt Summit itself. Some feedback for Christopher and the Foundation Board. Some ideas. <laughs> for the Foundation Board. Okay, and that's it. Anything you want to pick up from that? We have roughly <coughs> seven minutes left. I will pick up the, 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 the issue of uh, uh, feminine entrepreneurship. If you look at the whole planet, I think today it's something whose importance is probably highly underestimated. If you take, for example, the, the Muslim companies, the power of the female entrepreneurs in Muslim countries is just amazing. And uh, in our, um, I would say, OECD countries, I see a, a growing number of mothers who at one stage of, of their life um, often earlier than their husband to become entrepreneurs. And I think the, the, the female entrepreneurship is something which will be linked in one way or another with the externalization of the expertise. Uh, because today, large organizations, you know that large organizations have a strong debate to know whether they, they, they internalize the expertise or they externalize the expertise. And uh, women sometimes who have, as we have seen the values, uh, more wisdom than men, obviously, um, and care and so on and so forth, uh, are probably um, more brave at an earlier stage of their career to say, I am fed up with all the restructuration going one after the others in, in, within my big companies I want to be more on my own, and, uh, and I will be an entrepreneur. So I think around that we have a, a, a very key long-term question. And second point about the Zermatt Summit, uh, I think what is important is uh, uh, from one Zermatt Summit to another, how a working process can be in place in order to continue to make flourishing 
the fascinating days that uh, the Zermatt Foundation is uh, uh, inv inviting us uh, to live here? It's, it's, a, it's an important question. Thank you. Nicola? Yes, just... Uh, Could you stand up? Because it's easier for the yes, people uh, doing the photograph. Just uh, to look at the uh, feedback from the groups, I uh, just want to say that uh, on education, uh, we've spent a lot of time on business, but uh, there was much more coming out. Uh, there were ideas, very interesting ideas, of building up platforms for people to learn about uh, what is leadership, entrepreneurship, and so on, to be uh, available for politicians, and uh, so the larger area than uh, business. There are many groups who came out with the uh, question about definitions. We discussed uh, what is ethic, but uh, uh, there were people also asking, how do we define common goods? What is it? Does it also only include society, or does that cover also the planet? And we came up with the question that we are talking a lot about societal things. Shouldn't we include the green aspect, environment? And Joel this morning mentioned that. And also, um, there was um, very interestingly in the education uh, this idea of new ways of learning and uh, several groups came up with the uh, wiki techniques. Thank you. Um, I think there are no other questions. Oh, there's one other question or comment or whatever from Jakob. There's a microphone coming to you at the back. And there's a gentleman here. I can't see who it is as usual with the light in my eyes. Sometimes I can see and sometimes I can't. One, two, three, four. We have less than four minutes left. So please keep your comments brief, uh, as punchy as possible, please. Yeah, very briefly. Thomas My name Friedman. is Jose del Rio from uh, Chile. I just would like to make honor to our small group that coined a beautiful phrase that was our past, that uh, Javier and uh, Frederic and some others said, we need seven billion entrepreneurs in the world. So whatever we can do for people to take in charge of their own lives, in any kind of business, not only business, but all kinds, social entrepreneurship, education, etc., giving more this moral virtue of moral reasoning that rather than moral obedience, which is a structure of usual way of organizing our society. Could be very good. I think it is, and so many institutions are helping that. I'm just finishing, uh, sorry, one minute, that this means if we really create entrepreneurial attitude everywhere, large business is not so bad as I heard yesterday. I come from big business, I'm sorry. And we, we are really big in our country. But I think it all depends on leadership. If we have people who can react to bad leaders and leaders who really go in an ethical way, we can change a little bit the world. Thank you. Jakob? Thomas. <laughs> Jakob. Thomas Friedman said that the more boring it is, the more important it is. Laws are boring, mm. but they are crucial. Businesses operate within laws. You educate for the world which exists. So if you really want to change it, you have to change the laws. You have to look at corporate legislation in your country. You have to decide what changes you want to have the kind of business model which you would like to see and what you need to change with uh, the current system with the sort of North Korean uh, corporations we heard about before. And I suggest you start looking at limited liability. Limited liability was introduced a couple of centuries ago for very specific short-term endeavors. It was not a right without a responsibility. It was for ventures which were seen to bring clear benefit to the public. So if we go back to that, if we limit this limited li uh, legal liability, then I think we will have a wake-up call and many of the students and many of the professors will understand what ethics is about because it's no longer something abstract, it's no longer trying to go against the stream, it's going with the existing framework. So I would just urge you to pay much more attention to that because without that, it's going to be nice and we're going to talk and it's going to be too little too late because you cannot build niches. You are not going to get a new mainstream uh, unless you change the legal framework. Thank you. Arthur. I still have one or two hands. Mr. Von Hames, please. And who else? Uh, and yes, this gentleman over here. Please, Mr. Von Hames, go ahead. Yes, to elaborate on what uh, the gentleman but said. But we have only 50 seconds yeah, left. Yeah, because we, we, we discussed it in our group, which was a great group, probably the best one. Uh, but we need your help. Uh, we touch one issue without finding any idea. And I think it's a key issue. Mm -hmm. 
In our OCD countries, we are not able to propose jobs to 30% of the young people mm. coming to Come into the work. occupation age, working age, yes. What idea should we find? Because that's really something destroying society. And I, I believe when we're speaking about humanizing globalization, we should find ways to propose jobs to our young people. Thank you for your ideas. Thank you. Excellent. And the last comment, please, from here. We are two seconds, one second. Vincent left. Gerito, very shortly. Very, Vincent Gerito from France. Uh, I hear many, many excellent ideas. And in our group, one key point was about disseminating, educating people. And what I have uh, as uh, an insight from the, the expose by Jimmy Wales this morning is that the means are here to disseminate. The internet is here. The r social networks are here. Everything is at our disposal to share those ideas, those insights to make uh, ideas improve uh, and, 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 uh, and make the world better. Thank you. And just to encourage all of us before we bring this session to a close, I have in front of me a press release today issued by OPTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. They are putting together a seminar between the 22nd and 24th of this month, so that's around now, making trade and finance work for people and the planet. So it's not just uh, strange people like us sitting around in Zermatt, but it's also some strange people being brought together by a very strange organization called UNCTAD. And on top of that, another press release has just come in. The United Nations Human Rights Council has just endorsed, so this is no longer discussion, this is now a decision, endorsed new guiding principles on business and human rights. So lots of positive things are going on. Uh, Ted, where's Ted? Ted wanted us to be positive. We can be positive. Uh, all our talking is great. Uh, and if we can add to some of these initiatives, uh, then that's even better. May I thank all of us very much, particularly Pierre, of course, as usual, for taking us through this. <laughs>